All right, this morning, uh, for those of you that haven't been here, I started talking about four basics to hearing God's voice. And the very first thing we talked about is that everyone has a conscience that, that was given to us when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you violate your conscience, if you aren't doing what God has already shown you in your heart, there's no reason for him to give you any further revelation. You need to be faithful with what God has given you before you get more. And the conscience is a basic way of God speaking to you. We used specifically Romans chapter 1 and showed that this is something that every single person has. Even if you're an unbeliever, even people that don't know the Lord have the witness of the conscience so that it says they are without excuse. There's never going to be anybody stand before God and say, I didn't know. That's a lie. You do know. We know more than we acknowledge, amen. We know in our people that are living these weird lifestyles and the things that are being promoted, they know in their heart. And so anyway, you're held accountable for your conscience. That's the foundational way that God speaks to you. And these things that I'm talking about are kind of like they are like rungs on a ladder. You have to start at the bottom and work your way up. You have to, uh, you have to be conscious of this conscience and submit to it. That's the basic way that God speaks to you. And then yesterday I talked about how that the Word of God is really the foundation of everything else. The conscience is something that even people that don't know the Lord has, but once you get born again, man, the Word of God is the greatest way that God speaks to us. And I even made a statement yesterday that probably 99% of all of the instruction you will ever need from God will come through the Word of God. And I really believe that. There's a lot of people that don't believe that. They don't put the importance on the Word of God. But the Word of God is the plumb line. It's the standard that you compare everything else to. And you've got to know the Word of God. If we didn't have the record of Scripture, I said this yesterday, we wouldn't even know how to spell Jesus. We wouldn't understand His teachings. We wouldn't have any of the revelation. We wouldn't know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I tell you, the Word of God is just super foundational, and yet the average person does not spend very much time in the Word of God. You know, that's the reason we have a Bible school, and it's amazing, but when people come to our Bible school, the only textbook we have is the Bible. Once you get into the third year classes, they have some special teachings that they do for business, and for we have a business track. We have eight different tracks in our third year, but... The Bible, it's a Bible college and, and you have to read through the Bible. The Bible is important. It's your daily bread. Job said that he desired the word of God more than his daily bread. Man, if we were as hungry for the word of God as we are for food, man, it would transform our life. Scripture says that God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And man, we just, what we don't know is killing us. And so the Word of God is foundational, but God can speak to you beyond the Word of God, but He will never speak anything that will ever contradict God's Word. So this ha you have to know this. If you don't know the Word of God, then you won't have anything to compare the feelings, the impressions, the things that you think God is doing in your life. So ignorance of the Word of God is the biggest hindrance to hearing the voice of God. God speaks through His Word. So what I want to do this morning, and then I'm going to minister again this afternoon, but I want to talk about how that your born-again spirit is in communion with God, and your born-again spirit knows things, and you can be led by your born-again spirit. Now again, I wouldn't know these things if it wasn't for the Word of God and what it's taught me. And I'm just going to say some things quickly. I haven't got time to go into great depth on this, but when you get born again, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things, behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto God by himself. That's what the Bible says. In your spirit is where this change took place. Your body doesn't change. If you were a man before you got saved, you're still going to be a man after you get saved. I don't care how you feel on a certain day. If you were a woman before you got saved, you're going to still be a woman. Your body doesn't change. 
Your mind doesn't instantly change. It's subject to change. You can renew it. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says we become transformed by the renewing of our mind. So you can change your thinking, but your mind doesn't instantly change. It has to be educated. So that only leaves the spirit. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he's praying a prayer and he says, I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. And so that shows you, you got three parts. Your body and your soul aren't instantly changed. That only leaves the spirit. In the spirit, you are a completely brand new person. And this is the revelation that just really changed my life is understanding who I was in the spirit and learning how to go by the spirit instead of just by my physical mind and my feelings and emotions. And I could amplify, there's everything I teach really comes out of this truth about that it's in our spirit that we are already complete. You're as complete in your spirit as you'll ever be in eternity. Your spirit's already completely saved. Your body is not, your soul isn't, but your spirit right now is perfect. And I just want to focus on one thing. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, it says that we have the mind of Christ. That is not up here in this brain. Your born again spirit, I'm pointing to my belly because John chapter seven says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the next verse says, this spake he of the spirit that they that believed upon him would receive. So the Bible implies that your spirit's in your belly. Some of us look like we got more of the spirit than others. <laughs> but it's not so. But in, I keep pointing to my belly. So in my belly, I have a mind in my spirit. My spirit has been, I have the mind of Christ. And according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, it says you have an unction from the Holy One. That word unction means a special endowment, a special gifting of God. And you know all things. It didn't say you know some things. You know all things. Most people just have a disconnect here because functionally, they don't acknowledge the spirit. Most people are only what the Bible calls carnal, controlled by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And if you, if you don't feel it, if you don't feel healed, well, then you don't believe that you're healed. You don't believe you're healed until a doctor tells you you're healed, until the pain leaves. That's what the Bible calls carnal. <clears throat> Thank you for that thunder silence. <laughs> But you can get to a place that you believe. And anyway, I could just expound on that. But in your spirit, you have the mind of Christ and you know all things. And if you have this foundation of the word of God, then you'll be able to judge is what you're feeling. These impressions that you have, are they from God or is it just your physical self? The scripture says in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, that the word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Soul is the emotional, mental part of you. Spirit is this born again part of you that has the mind of Christ. And so it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Man, that's a powerful scripture right there. If you want to know, is what I'm feeling, is this impression that I've got, is this from God or is it just my flesh? Is this just my own thinking or is this God? Man, as Charlie was praying up here, how does anybody make it without God? I don't know. How does anybody make it without knowing the word of God? I don't know. And that's the reason that people are the many, many people are like a train wreck and they're just having problem after problem is because you are leaning under your own understanding. Proverbs chapter three, verse five, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. You got to get away from your own thinking. You need to be led by the spirit instead of led by God. So how do you know if these impressions are from God or whether they're just your own thoughts? Man, I've got so many things I'd love to say. Well, I hadn't got time to say it. 
Well, I want to hear E.W. this morning. But, man, I've, I've got a lot of things I could share with you. But anyway, your, your thoughts, your spirit man, let me say it this way, your spirit man... When God speaks to your spirit, you are one with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the word for one there in the Greek is H-E-I-S. It means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It's not like here's God's spirit up here and here's your spirit down here, a baby spirit. Did you know that the, when you get born again, you're, when you got born again, you got the fullness of the Godhead in you bodily. And when you go to be with the Lord, your body's going to be changed. Your soul is going to be changed. But your spirit is right this second identical to the spirit you will have throughout all eternity. And according to... 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, as Jesus is, so are you in this world. That's not talking about your body. It's not talking about your soul. But in your spirit, your spirit is identical to Jesus in every way, in anointing, in power, and in knowledge. You have the mind of Christ. You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. So your spirit, when God speaks to your spirit, when... You're in communion with him. You're one. And he doesn't say, E.W., I want you to do this. But instead, God's spirit is in communion with E.W.'s spirit. And E.W. will think, I think I'm supposed to do this. You'll hear it in the first person. God doesn't speak to you in the third person because you're one with him. And so some of us are waiting for God to say, Andrew, go do this. But that's not how it happens. God will, ju- I just know things because my spirit is in union and I'll know that I'm supposed to do this. When I started the Bible college, all of a sudden, I just knew that I was supposed to start the Bible college. When I started on television, all of a sudden, I just knew that I was supposed to be on television. I, you just know things. And if you don't understand, if you don't know the word of God and if you haven't renewed your mind, you will sit there and say, I wonder if that's me. This is like what I said, you know, when I was encouraging people come to the Bible college and they say, I really want to come to Bible college, but I don't know if that's God or not. You take the word of God and you divide between soul and spirit. Does your soul want you to sit under the word of God and get your life changed and renewed? That is not your flesh. Your flesh does not want you to be learning about God and serving God. And, you, and so your spirit just knows things, but you won't be able to discern, is this me or is it God, unless you know the word of God. And if your desires are consistent with the word of God, well, then it's God. I'm gonna say something here that most people choke on. Religion doesn't like this at all, but it says in Psalms chapter 37, verse four, I'm just quoting a lot of stuff because I hadn't got time to turn to every one of them. But Psalms 37, four, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll just give you anything you want because some of you want a new mate and some of you want a million dollar home and, then, and God's not against us having things, but you just use that verse as an excuse for you to lust for anything and say, God is gonna give me whatever I want. That's not what that's saying. That's saying that when you delight yourself in the Lord, he puts his desires in your heart. Some of you, before you got born again, you were a drunk, you were an uh, alcoholic, you were a drug dealer, you were... Uh, addicted to lust and to sexual sins and yet you get born again and all of a sudden things change and the things that you used to love you don't love anymore that's because you delighted yourself in the Lord and he changes the desires of your heart so God will lead you and this is what most people choke on but you know what I do whatever I want to do (laughs) and some people that's terrible that's because you aren't delighting yourself in the Lord. But if you delight yourself in the Lord, and that's a big if, if you've put God first, if you are putting God first in your life, you can do what you want to do because God will put his desires in your heart. 
And so, the, you know, when I was raised in the Baptist church, they, one of the things that they said was that if you want to know what God's will is, take whatever you want to do and do the opposite, and that's God. And did you know that's true for a carnal Christian? The Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity, it, the enemy of God, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. So you, you can't do the things that you would. And if you're carnal, it's true that your desires are going to be opposite God's desires. But if you are putting first the kingdom of God and delighting yourself in Him, your spirit is born again. It's one with the Lord. You're in communion and God will put His desires in your heart and you can do what you want to do if you are delighting yourself in the Lord. So one of the things, when I have desires, I'm aware that I can be carnal, that I can have the flesh or, you know, people's rejection or things uh, affecting my feelings and emotions. So if I have a desire to do something, what I'll do is just unplug from anything that's distracting me from the Lord. I may fast and pray and just put my mind on the Lord and make sure that I am delighting myself in Him. And if I do that, then if my desires are from the flesh, they diminish. The more I get in the presence of God and the more I'm focused on God and I know, well, that was just my flesh because I delight myself in the Lord, the desire gets less. But if I delight myself in the Lord and the desire gets greater, then I know that that's God. That's God communicating with my spirit. This is my spirit. I judge it by the word of God and let the word of God divide asunder between my soul and spirit. So you can be led of your spirit. God will put his desires in your heart, but you have to know the word of God. You know, I had a woman that criticized me because I put so much emphasis on the Word of God. And she was a Bible college student and she says, you need to be led more by the Spirit. And she was weird. <laughs> and she wanted me to be weird like her. And she thought, you're, she, she kept saying, you're word bound. You're just bound by the Word. And so anyway, she, was, she criticized me a number of times and we talked about stuff like that. And, and finally, one day she came and she said, I had a dream. And in this dream, you were standing on the beaches of Normandy and you were gonna start walking across these beaches of Normandy and there were just landmines everywhere. And she said that an angel came to you and gave you a map that showed where all the landmines are or... He said, I could just whisper in your ear and tell you which way to go and what step to take and stuff. And she said, you would just follow the map and you might make a mistake, but I listen to the Spirit and the Spirit leads me. And she thought that that was a recommendation for the Spirit. And I said, man, that is a perfect example of what I'm talking about, that how do you know you're reading the map right? It's because the Spirit's speaking to you. And how do you know that the voice you're hearing is correct? Because it matches the map. You actually need both of these things together, see? And some people just want to be led by the Spirit, but then you're subject to you hearing the wrong voice and it being your flesh instead of the Spirit. How do you know that the, what you're feeling is correct? Because it matches the Word of God. But on the other hand, you aren't just reading the Bible with your brain and interpreting it through your own ability. You're letting the Spirit quicken things to you. And when the Spirit and the Word agree, man, you know that you have heard from God. So the Word of God, again, is the foundation of everything. Nothing that you ever quote unquote receive from God will ever violate the Word. But God can give you impressions and tell you things. Like there's no scripture that I know of that says start on television, January the 3rd, 2000. <laughs> That's when I started on television. I don't know a scripture that says that, but I do know that I delighted myself in the Lord and I had had people offer me television time for free. And I knew that someday I'd do it because I just felt impressed that I was supposed to reach out through every possible means to reach people, so I knew it was in my future. I had been a guest on other people's television programs and uh, had great results, and so I knew it was coming, but it was expensive. It was a whole nother level of ministry, and I just was 
kicking the can down the road. I didn't desire it. Matter of fact, every time somebody offered me television time, I'd say, no way. I didn't want anything to do with it. And then all of a sudden, I was praying and my desires just totally changed. I mean, it completely changed. And instead of not desiring to be on television, I got so excited that for nearly a week, I didn't sleep and I sat down and drew the set. I knew exactly what I was gonna do. I could see myself on TV and my desires changed to where I was so excited. And I spent a couple of weeks just praying about it to make sure that I was hearing things properly. I delighted myself in the Lord and the desire just increased. And that's how I knew I was supposed to go on television. When it came to the Bible college, I had told people many, many times that no, I'll never start a Bible college because I'd seen people who graduated from Bible college and I didn't want my name associated with that. <laughs> And it was just intellectual knowledge. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, that if you think you know anything, you know nothing yet, as you ought to know. And it says you're puffed up. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, 1 Corinthians 8, 1. And so I just, I had seen Bible college as just information, just knowledge, and people leave with a wrong attitude. And so anyway, I told everybody, I'll never have a Bible college. And I was in England in 1992, this is that example I was talking about that we had problems at home and I wasn't gonna go and yet Jamie wouldn't let me stay. She said, I'll stay and deal with it by myself. And, uh, and anyway, I felt terrible and I went out on that rock and got to praying and singing that song, God is my refuge and God told me to go. And when I was in England, all of a sudden, everything just changed and I thought, I've got to start a Bible school. And it was so contrary to anything I'd ever thought in my life. I said, this probably is God because this is not the way I would think. And so I prayed about it and anyway, the desire continued. And this is how God spoke to me. There isn't a scripture that says start Karis Bible College. There isn't a scripture that says start on television. There isn't a scripture that'll tell you certain things, but the scripture will guide you and confirm it and it will provide the basis of it. So you've got to take what you are, the impressions that you're getting in your spirit because they're one with the Lord and God is communicating to you spirit to spirit. And when you get these desires, you have to go to the word of God. Is this consistent with the word? If you're wanting another mate, that's not consistent with the word. You're supposed to love the one you're married to and not lust for somebody else's wife. If you're wanting to win the lottery, that's not consistent with the word. The scripture teaches against gambling and getting things quickly and wealth gotten by vanity takes away the life of the owners thereof. Some of you are, are got a word from God that you're gonna win the lottery. You know, when I was real young in the Lord, I remember that Jamie and I were struggling financially and, and W.O. Bankston in Dallas, Texas was giving away a Mark IV Lincoln Continental. And I thought, man, I'm a believer and God loves me and I'm gonna win this. And so I just assumed that, man, I could use my faith and win this lottery and win a Mark IV Lincoln Continental. And I, I went to church that night. I couldn't wait to tell people. And this guy walked up to me and before I could tell him, he says, God told me I'm gonna win that Lincoln <laughs> Continental. And I thought, wait a minute. God told me I was gonna win this Lincoln Continental. And I realized that, you know, God doesn't fix the lottery. He doesn't fix these raffles. If you are trying to use your faith, that's inconsistent with the word. That's not the way that God wants to prosper you. If you can't say amen, say, oh me. There's some of you that you've been believing. That's the way you're trying to get things done. That's not the Lord. Hate to pop your bubble, but it's gonna get popped anyway. So anyway, God speaks to you spirit to spirit. You know, let me give another example to you that when I was um, first turned on to the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968, and I had this miraculous encounter with the Lord, uh, it, it goes along with what I was just saying, but I was in my first year of Bible college, or excuse me, first year of secular college, and I was just excited because my mother had gotten a scholarship to go back to college and get her master's degree, so she moved to Oklahoma, and I was living at home by myself. 
I was on my own. I was going to college. It was exciting, and I just loved uh, being out on my own and going to class and doing these things. But then I had this encounter with the Lord, and man, I got caught up into the presence of God, and I lost my interest in anything else. I had a horse that I rode every day of my life, every day, rain, snow, anything. And I, it was four and a half months later before I even thought about that horse. I didn't know if anybody had fed it. I didn't know if it was still alive. I just lost my desire for anything, and I lost my desire to be in college. And so I just said, man, I'm going to quit because I was paying to go to college and I never went to class. <laughs> I went to class. I, I started towards class every day, but I was so excited. I was witnessing to people and I'd get to talking to somebody about the Lord and it'd be time to go to class. And I couldn't let them die and go to hell just because it was time <laughs> to go to class. So I'd keep talking to them. And then... I'd miss that class, and so I'd just find somebody else, and I'd keep talking, and by the time the next class came up, I was talking to somebody else. So I went to class for two and a half months and never made it to class <laughs> because I was witnessing to people, and, I, and so I just decided, I'm going to quit. And man, when I said that, boy, the feathers hit the fan. I mean... It was bad news. I was told by my church that you couldn't be a Christian and say that God told you to quit school, which I know some of you think I'm exaggerating that, but I was in a highbrow Baptist church that they used the seminary professors as fill-ins, and you had to sit there with a dictionary to listen to it because they thought that, you know, the more unintelligible it was, the more anointed it was or something, and... And anyway, it was just a highbrow Baptist church, and, and this was during the height of the Vietnam War, and I was getting money from the government, $350 a month from my dad's Social Security because he died when I was 12 years old. So I was getting paid by the government to go to school. I got a deferment from the draft if I stayed in school. Plus, I had a future if I stayed in school. But if you quit, you were just going to be a loser. And so I just lost interest and I said I wasn't going to go to school. And boy, my church turned against me. My mother didn't talk to me for two weeks. And finally, I took her out to eat and I said, you are going to say something to me. And she started crying and she says, I'm just so embarrassed. I'm so ashamed of you. And that's... and. She didn't mean it bad. My mother and I had a great relationship. And she came back around and became one of my biggest supporters and biggest fans. But uh, anyway, everybody, everybody turned against me. And so because of that, I went back and stayed in school because my mother said that you've got to finish school. So I was going to obey. And I hated it. And I did make a few classes after she forced me <laughs> to go back, but it was pitiful. And I was staying up till three or four every night with my friends studying the word. And so I was sleepy. And I remember one time being in class and I fell asleep and fell out of my chair right on, <laughs> right on the instructor's feet. <laughs> and he didn't say a word. He just kept going. So I just put my head down and slept through class. <laughs> But I hated going to class, but I was doing it. And anyway, I would get together with my friends and uh, we would study the word. And I was just really beginning to learn the word. And I came across Romans 14, 23. It says, uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And when I read that, it was like 8 o'clock at night. Normally, we'd stay up until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning studying the Word. And when I read that, man, the Word came alive. This is how God speaks to you, is through the Word. If I hadn't have been reading the Word, I'm not sure I would have gotten this. But all of a sudden, God just took that last part of that verse and highlighted it to me and said, you are in sin because you think that you are supposed to quit school and yet you aren't acting in agreement with it. And man, I told my friends, I said, look, I'm in sin. I said, I'm not going to be in sin tomorrow. I'm going home. And instead of staying up, I went home and I got before the Lord and I said, God, I've got to make a decision to the best of my understanding. I don't want to be in school. I don't think this is what you have for me. And again, you know, different people... Uh, 
E.W. finished Harvard and stuff, cum laude, or however you say it, cum laude. <laughs> See, that shows you, I, did, I quit school. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, he finished school with honors. I quit school. And so some people need to go to school. I'm not against school, but for me, that was not what God put in my heart. I was going to be a math major and a teacher, and this is what, not what God had for me. And I just knew it in my heart. But everybody was telling me I was wrong. And I was only a few months old in following the Lord and listening to the Lord. And who was I to exalt my opinion above the pastor of the church? The pastor of the church told me I was of the devil for even saying this. And I had everybody come out against me. And so how do you, how do you decide? And I just was home saying, God, I've got to have a word from you. How do I know if this is you? speaking to me or if this is just me making a wrong decision. And the Lord led me to Colossians chapter 3 as I was just studying and asking. See again, God speaks to you through the Word. Now He can speak beyond the Word, but it'll never contradict the Word. It'll be confirmed by the Word. And so I was studying in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 15 and it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. And the word rule here is the uh, Greek word that we get umpire from. Just like in baseball, an umpire, you know, behind the plate, they throw the ball and the umpire doesn't say, well, I'm not sure, let's just do it over. No, if you're an umpire, you got to make a decision and you call a ball or a strike and they may say that you're, you're blind or something like that. But nonetheless, the umpire has to make a decision and you just stick with it. So an umpire, let the word, peace of God rule in your heart. Let it be the umpire. Let Just call the shots. And the Lord spoke to me through this verse and said, let the peace of God rule in your heart. And another passage that goes along with this is Galatians 5.22 where it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You have all of those things in your spirit. Now you may not feel peace, you may not feel love, you may not feel joy, but the truth is your spirit is always rejoicing. Your spirit does not get depressed. If you're depressed... You aren't in the spirit, you're in the flesh. You're going by what you see and feel. And in your spirit, you always, always, and in the Greek, that means always, <laughs> have peace. Your spirit always has peace about what God is leading you to do. And it says, let the peace of God rule. Let it call the shots. And so I thought, well, God... What do I have peace about? And to be honest, I didn't have peace about either of these decisions because if I quit school, I could be drafted, I could be sent to Vietnam, it could cost me my life. I was going to lose money. I was going to lose the acceptance of nearly every person that I knew. I was going to be in for a lot of criticism if I decided to quit school because nobody I knew agreed with me. And yet, when I thought about staying in school, I felt zero peace. I don't have the words to describe to you how badly I felt about going to school. I had nightmares for over 20 years after this. And my night, I dreamed this at least once or twice a year. And I would be back in school. And it'd be time to go to class. And I was trying to find, where do I go? It was a nightmare. I'd wake up in cold sweats. Anyway, this is a sidebar, but I finally went to a church and there was this man, the pastor Dan Funkhauser was his name. And Dan Funkhauser, he just, he's one of the strangest people I've ever met. <laughs> but he just didn't give a rip what anybody thought about him. He was so secure. He had, he had his problems and stuff, but he just didn't care what anybody thought. And I started going to his church and uh, anyway, I had one of those nightmares, the last time I ever had one. And in that dream, I actually made it to class. The first time I'd ever made it to class in 20 years. I was sitting in my third grade class. I don't know why this was, but I was in my third grade class in one of those little tiny chairs. 
And I was sitting there and I was listening to my third grade teacher. And I was thinking, what am I doing here? How did this happen? And I looked over and Dan Funkhauser was in the desk next to me. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing here? And he said, the press question is, what are you doing here? Why do you care what people think about you? He says, let's get up and get out of here. And I said, okay. And so we got up. And when I got to the door, I opened the door back up and looked in and I said, I'll never have this dream again. And I never have. And that's been 20 or 30 years ago. But all of these nightmares that I was having, it was because I was struggling with people's acceptance. And that's what caused me to not have any peace about following this direction is because I was so worried about people rejecting me and everybody criticizing me. So I didn't have total peace in either direction. What I decided was, and this is what came to me, I just felt like if the Lord put a gun to my head and said, make a decision, you got to make a decision now because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And I'd already determined I wasn't going to be in sin tomorrow. And so he, if somebody stuck a gun to my head and said, make a decision. And if you make the wrong decision, I'm going to blow your brains out. I'm going to kill you. Life and death decision. Which one did I have the most peace about? Well, I didn't have total peace about quitting school because of all the consequences, but I had zero peace about staying in school. And so based on Colossians 3.15, I said, I'm going to let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I made a decision and I said, in the name of Jesus, I'm quitting school regardless of the consequences. And so I went to bed. And the next day I got up and the three people who had criticized me the most I decided I was going to go to them. Now, see, if you aren't totally sure, you probably ought to go to somebody who is more mature in the Lord than you, than you are and get their input. But I didn't have anybody like that. And uh, if you aren't sure, you don't necessarily have to just burn all your bridges behind you at once, but you need to move in that direction. You, faith without works is dead. So you need to head in that direction that God has given you. And so what I did, I went to the three people who had criticized me the most. One of them was my youth director who just jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug, telling me that I was missing God and he, and he was really influential in my life. And uh, I went to him and told him, and he says, I think that's God. Just totally shocked me. He was totally different. And I went to this teacher that I had in high school. She was a Christian and she was an outspoken Christian and she was a friend of my mother. My mother was a uh, superintendent in the school system. And so she knew my mother and she thought she was really uh, defending my mother by turning on me and telling me that you need to stay in school. And she had just told me that I was totally wrong and she was vicious towards me. And anyway, I went into her and I just told her, I said, Miss Ellis, I've made my decision. And she says, what's your decision? And boy, I braced myself and I said, God told me to quit school and I'm quitting college. And she just looked at me and started crying. And she says, I'd give anything to be in your shoes. And I was just shocked. And I said, why? And she said, because, you know, I don't know how old she was, but 50 or 60, you know, when you're 18, she looked ancient. <laughs> She's probably younger than I am. But anyway, she just said, I'm so many years old and I don't know for sure that I've ever done what God told me to do. She says, I hope what I'm doing pleases God, but I don't know for sure. And she asked me to pray for her. And did you know, after going to those three people, I was so absolutely convinced that God had told me to do this, that man, I've never doubted it since then. And it was one of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my life. And it may sound like a small thing to you, but it just changed the whole course of my life. I was drafted. I was sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, I just spent 10 to 15 hours a day studying the Bible. And, and when I went to Vietnam, I was a Baptist. And when I came out, I wasn't. And I didn't mean to change. I didn't even want to change. But I went back to my Baptist church and <laughs> because I was standing on certain things in the Bible that they didn't believe, they asked me to leave. 
It changed the whole course of my life. It was one of the greatest decisions I ever made. And all I did was just say, I'm not going to be in sin. I had Romans 14, 23 speak to me. I went to Colossians 3, 15. I let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I began to start being led by my born again spirit. I knew all things in my spirit. Did you know all of you have done this at one time or another? I can guarantee you at some time you have had, you faced a decision and you uh, had to decide between some options and you let logic, you let other people influence you, you let money influence you or whatever. And so you did what it was logical, but you didn't feel peace about it. And then after you did it, it didn't work out and you go, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. How did you know it? It was your born again spirit that is in communion with God and you know all things in your spirit. And yet most people let circumstances, things, people influence them more than being led by the spirit. The scripture says if you walk in the spirit, then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking in the spirit isn't being weird and having just strange things. It's, it's being led by your spirit, confirming the word of God. And there will be truths. And you put that map and you put the spirit together. And I guarantee you, God will lead you and show you. And this is how you hear God's voice. It doesn't come in the third person. It's not Andrew, go do this. It's just all of a sudden, I think I'm supposed to do this because my spirit is in communion with God. And if you aren't aware of this, if you don't see, if you don't know the word of God, you won't know that your spirit has an unction from the Holy One and knows all things. You won't know that you have the mind of Christ. You won't know that according to 1 uh, John 2, 27, that you don't need any man to teach you, but as that same anointing teaches you all things and is truth and is no lying, even as he hath taught you, you shall abide in him. The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. John chapter 16, verse 13. The Spirit will bring back to your remembrance all things that I have spoken unto you whatsoever I have said. Man, the Word of God and the Spirit agree. And you've got to get to where you hear God's voice through not violating your conscience, through knowing what the Word says, and then letting your Spirit quicken those things. And all of a sudden, you combine that map along with the Word of God, and man, you have a, a confidence that you have heard from God. Man, that's awesome. That is awesome. And I could give you hundreds of experiences since then about where this has just become a guiding thing. I haven't done it perfectly. When I was pastoring in uh, Pritchett, Colorado, I had the elders there want me to anoint an, uh, another elder because the, uh, the elders that we had were leaving on wheat harvest and they felt like I needed an elder there in the church with me. So they suggested this one guy. I didn't have anything against him. He was a nice guy. He was a friend of mine. But I just didn't feel good about him. And I said, no. And they said, well, why not? And I said, I don't have a reason. I just don't feel like that's the right one. And anyway, over a period of a month or more, they just kept pressuring me. You've got to appoint somebody. So finally, I said, okay, appoint him. And we made him an elder. And I put him in as an elder, and the next Sunday, all of the other elders left on weed harvest, and this guy got up in front of the church and accused me of lying, stealing money from the church, committing adultery, uh, doing booze. He just lied, and he just turned into the devil himself. And when he did, I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. And did you know, since that time, that's been about 60, when was that? I don't even know, 69 no, that can't be right. 79. Since 1979, man, to the best of my ability, I have tried to never violate the peace that I feel in my heart. I let the peace of God rule. And it has saved my bacon a thousand times. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So again, let's have the prayer ministers come up here in between the break here. You can come and receive prayer. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break and come back, and E.W. Jackson's going to be up. It's going to be a good time. So go out, get your...
uh, fix on all of the materials out there and come and get prayer and we'll be back in 10 minutes.